Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about uh, the mechanics of translation. So how does everything come together? And uh, like DNA replication, like transcription, uh, we can break down translation into three phases. Uh, the initiation phase in which um, all of the components uh, collect at the, the place in which translation is going to start. Then we have elongation, which is the production of the polymer, in this case of our protein, the polypeptide. And then termination, that ribosome reaches the uh, stop site and everything comes apart. So let, we're going to focus uh, on initiation and all of these processes in prokaryotes, specifically E. coli. It's been very well studied. Now there is differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We'll look at some of those differences uh, a little bit later, but for the most part there is enough similarity that we can apply what we learn here to uh, eukaryotes. Now initiation in prokaryotes depends upon three important initiation factors. Uh, initiation factor 1, IF1, IF2, and IF3. So IF3 binds to the E site of the small subunit, and it remains bound there uh, in the absence of messenger RNA. And what it does is it inhibits that large subunit from binding. So we don't want the two subunits of RNA to come uh, of the ribosome to come together unless we have a messenger RNA there. Now. Initiation factor 1 binds to the A site, and it inhibits the binding of transfer RNAs to the A site. Okay, Because the very first transfer RNA that binds has to be the initiator uh, tRNA. We'll look at that. And that initiator tRNA, by the way, uh, binds to the P site, not the A site. So that leaves the P site open there. And then finally, it's initiation factor 1 that recruits IF2 GTP. Now, IF2 is a regulatory GTPase, and we'll talk in a bit of detail uh, about what that means in just a few slides, but there are gonna be several regulatory GTPases that we see in translation. It'll become a trend. Now, this um, IF2 GTP, it's in its active state, which means the IF2 is going to bind to something else. What does it bind to? Well, it binds to the F met tRNA F. This is the initiator tRNA. It's a special tRNA that uh, brings in that first methionine to that first AUG of the protein. So here uh, is, again, this is the setup that we have. There is the active uh, IF2 GTP. And again, because it's bound to GTP, it's in its active state. And because of that, it binds to, it sticks to, it recruits our F, um, FMET tRNA F, the initiator tRNA. This is the only transfer RNA that will ever bind directly to the P site. This is the only tRNA that binds to IF2 GTP. Now the question is, how did the ribosome, the small, um, how does the small unit know which AUG is the is the correct AUG? Well, that brings us back to these ribosome binding sites, these Shine Delgarno sites. Because we have polycystronic uh, mRNAs, that means we have lots of different start sites. So it's not just the first AUG starting from the 5' end like it is in eukaryotes. It could be anywhere within that messenger RNA. Then what's unique about an AUG here and maybe not an AUG here? Well, this AUG here is preceded by a ribosome binding site. Just like we, we see here. Here's an AUG, and then there's the ribosome binding site. What that allows for is that the 16S ribosomal RNA is reverse complementary to that ribosomal binding site, which then puts the P site of that ribosome, of that small subunit, right over the top of that AUG. That's how the cell knows that that is a start AUG and not just some random AUG in the middle of a protein. All right, so 
Now, once we have the FMET uh, tRNA bound to the IF2 GTP, we, the IF3 is released and that allows for the ribosome, the large subunit to then bind to this complex here. Okay, now it's time to talk about what a regulatory GTP ace is. IF2 is an example of one such molecule. And what it means is IF2 can bind to a GTP, and when it does so, it is in its active state. It can bind to stuff. But it also has GTPase activity, meaning that it can hydrolyze its own GTP and convert it into GDP. Normally, this enzymatic activity is not active. It's turned off until this whole protein comes in contact to it with another protein called a gap, a GTPase activating protein. Well, this gap, when it bumps into this molecule here, it activates this molecule's GTPase activity, causing this molecule to turn the GTP that it's binding to into GDP, thereby releasing an inorganic phosphate. Now, now that IF2 or whatever regulatory GTPase we're talking to is bound to GDP instead of GTP, it is now in an inactive state and it lets go of whatever it was binding to. It unbinds. And now it's off. Well, how does this get turned back on? How do we go back into this state here? Well, there's another type of protein called a GEF a guanine nucleotide exchange factor that when that GEF bumps into our regulatory GTPase, it catalyzes the ejection of GDP and a replacement with a brand new GTP. Guanine nucleotide exchange factor. Okay, that exchange meaning it's getting rid of the GDP and it's adding the GTP. And now, it's active again and it can bind and recruit stuff again. So that's how all of these regulatory GTP aces work. So our question here is, what is, a, okay, so in order for the two to let go of this, uh, this tRNA, right, and to let the next process start, something has to be the gap of IF2 GTP has to catalyze the turning off of uh, the IF2 or catalyze the activation of the GTPase to um, hydrolyze GTP. Now, what is that? It is the factor binding center of the large subunit. It's a portion of the large subunit that when it comes in contact with IF2 GTP, it activates the IF2 GTPase activity, converting that GTP to GDP, and then that allows for the, uh, G, the IF2 and IF1 to dissociate and allow for the A site to open up and allow translation to continue. So that brings us to elongation. Okay, so elongation requires transfer RNAs that are bound to specific amino acids to recognize the codons within the A site. Now, as these transfer RNAs that have been charged with amino acids, as they're floating around in the cytoplasm, they're protected by what's called a EFTU GTP. This is another regulatory GTPase, and its role is to protect this covalent bond that connects the transfer RNA to the amino acid. So it's, it, it inhibits random peptide formation outside of a ribosome. And so floating around, we have this molecule here. And eventually what happens is that aminoacyl tRNA, so that means our uh, tRNA that is carrying an amino acid recognizes this open A site, the anticodon binds to the codon, and EFTU is a, 
regulatory GTPase, meaning there exists a gap that will turn off this EFTU, that will activate the GTPase activity of EFTU. And what is that gap? Um, what is that gap? It's the factor binding center. So that factor binding center, when it comes in contact with the EFTU, turns it off, or I should say it turns on the GTPase activity, that GTP is converted into GDP, and the EFTU falls off and is no longer protecting the amino acid that's bound to this transfer RNA there. Okay, and only at this point can the formation of a peptide bond occur. Now, let's just, for a moment, let's see how this EFTU uh, turns on again so that it can protect another uh, amino acyl tRNA. Well, the GEF, the guanosine exchange factor, uh, what that does, so the GEF is EFTS. It kicks out the GDP and brings in a GTP, and so now our EFTS has been reset and combined to another amino acyl tRNA. Okay, let's take a look at peptide bond formation as it occurs in the ribosome here. So what we see is this is the FMET, right? So this is the initiator tRNA, or it is the, elong, it is the uh, polypeptide chain that has been growing, and this is the incoming amino acid. So the nucleophile is going to be the uh, alpha amino group nitrogen. The electrophile is going to be the alpha carbon, alpha carboxyl carbon. So we're going to get that. We are going to break the bond that's connecting this polypeptide to the uh, tRNA that's in the P site. And that growing chain is now going to be attached to the new amino acid, which is going to still be attached to its tRNA, which is now in the A site. So by the end of this, what we have is this, an empty tRNA in the P site and a tRNA in the A site that is carrying the growing polypeptide chain. When this occurs, or I should say after this occurs, the tRNAs are now in what's referred to as a hybrid state. What that means is the bottom portion of, so the anticodon is still within the A site, that, that newly entered tRNA, but the portion, the top portion is in the P site. The A site here is open at the top in the, the large subunit. The uh, previous tRNA, its anticodon is still bound to the P site, but now it is in the E site up here. So that's what we mean by hybrid state. Part of the tRNA is in one set of sites, and the other part of the TNA is a different set of sites. Now, this hybrid state is important because what that does is in the large subunit, it opens up the A site. And that A site is bound by a third important regulatory GTPase called EFG. When EFG is in its active state, when it's bound to GTP, it recognizes this hybrid state and it binds there. And when it does, its gap, again, is the factor binding site here, catalyzes the uh, uh, hydrolysis of GTP to GDP, and that it, what that does is it changes the conformation such that it, all of the, the uh, messenger RNA is shifted over such that now we're no longer in a hybrid state. This amino acid that's carrying the growing chain is uh, in the P site down below and in the P site at, at the top here as well. Uh, the uh, last transfer RNA that's empty is in the exit site in both cases. And now what we have is as soon as that GDP leaves, we have a new codon within the A site. So this EFG catalyzes the translocation of the messenger RNA. <clears throat> you can see that the, this protein here, this EFG protein, is a molecular mimic of 
to an amino acyl tRNA. So here's our amino acyl tRNA. This part here is protein. All this is RNA. And EFG, which is completely protein, even this portion here has that same molecular structure. Okay, even though they're made out of two completely different macromolecules. Kind of interesting. Now finally, eventually, at some point in the A site becomes a stop codon, one of the three stop codons. At that point, there is no transfer RNA with an anticodon that recognizes a stop codon. Instead, there is a protein called a release factor that recognizes this, uh, this stop codon here and an empty A site. It binds and it catalyzes the hydrolysis of the protein from the uh, last transfer RNA and catalyzes the dissociation of everything. Okay, IF3 comes in and is now covering up that uh, E site. Uh, IF1 is going to come in eventually, cover up that A site, and this process can start all over again. And here is our newly synthesized protein. Now, a single messenger RNA is going to be the uh, substrate for more than one ribosome at a time. So you get what's called a polysome. So in green is our messenger RNA, in blue are our ribosomes, and in red are the polypeptides. And so uh, as soon as a ribosome clears that start codon, another ribosome will bind, and you will then get lots and lots of proteins being made from a single messenger RNA, even at the same time. Now also don't forget in what's interesting in uh, bacteria is that because there's no nucleus, transcription and translation happens in the same place. So they are coupled, which means even before that messenger RNA is done being transcribed, so as it's being transcribed, as soon as the five prime end emerges, as soon as a ribosome binding site with an associated start codon emerges, boom, a ribosome binds to it and starts translating. So even before that messenger RNA is done being transcribed, you're already getting protein made from it. So it's incredibly efficient. There are some important differences between how translation occurs in eukaryotes and how it occurs in prokaryotes. And I'm not going to have you memorize all of those differences. Well, I'm not going to go through uh, all the details of them. I just want to know, want you to know the, the very generalities here. The first is that the initiation complex that occurs here in the small subunit is all set up independently of what's going on with the messenger RNA. So there are proteins that associate with the messenger RNA and proteins that associate with the um, small subunit, including the initiator tRNA, right? Look at that, that's already there even before any of that binds to the uh, um, messenger RNA. And then once those two separate complexes are complete, they bind to each other as we see here. And then what happens is we, as we start at the five prime end of the messenger RNA and it's sort of, it's, it's pulled through, pulled through, pulled through, scanning, 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 scanning until it finds the first AUG regardless of what reading frame it is. Notice there's no RBS here. Right? That ribosome is always going to bind to the five prime end and then scan, 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 scan for the first AUG. That's a big important difference. And finally, remember that eukaryotic messenger RNAs have a five prime G cap and a three prime poly A tail. And they're important because there are certain proteins that bind to each of them. Proteins that bind to the cap and proteins that bind to the three prime poly A tail. And these two sets of proteins interact with each other forming a big circle. Which means ribosomes start here at the five prime end and when they complete translation they end right back up where they began. And so it makes this, uh, uh, the, the local concentration of ribosomes much higher. They start at the same place they end and therefore can start over again. All right.
The last thing we're going to talk about is some examples of the regulation of translation, the regulation of protein synthesis as it applies to ferritin and the transferrin receptor.